accept the insistence of Egyptologists that the Sphinx is just four and a half thousand years old. By all means, yes, 2,500 BC, the ancient Egyptians were there, but I believe they found the Sphinx already created and already heavily eroded, and that they then recarved its head into the head of a pharaoh. In the heart of Egypt's ancient sands, the Great Sphinx has long fascinated archaeologists and historians. Recently, scientists have made a major discovery. Which involved much more than just looking at it. It involves seismic work as well, which identified a chamber under the left forepaw of the Sphinx. That's um, what happened. And, and he came to the conclusion that the weathering patterns on the Sphinx were caused by exposure to more than a thousand years of extremely heavy rainfall. Uncovering the Sphinx's hidden secrets. What could these secrets reveal? Could they change our understanding of history? Join us as we explore the mysteries of Egypt's Great Sphinx. The Sphinx, an ancient monument, has sparked many debates and speculations. To test many ideas, many New Age ideas about secret passages and hidden chambers under the Sphinx. Legends mention hidden tunnels, and recent studies suggest that there are undiscovered spaces within the Sphinx. A forbidden passage at the back, first found by Egyptologists Zahi Hawass and Mark Lehner, has been of great interest. An old worker's memory of a secret tunnel led to its discovery. For three weeks, they explored it but found only an empty shaft. Despite the disappointment, some explorers captured images of a hidden tunnel inside the Sphinx, suggesting more uncovered secrets. This discovery challenges previous beliefs and hints at further mysteries beneath the Sphinx. The Osiris Shaft, opening in the causeway connecting the Sphinx to the Second Pyramid, showcases ancient Egyptian engineering brilliance. This three-level structure, carved into solid bedrock, demonstrates the builder's remarkable skill and understanding. The entrance is a precisely crafted vertical shaft descending nearly 10 meters underground, created with tools, ropes, and wooden supports. The first chamber, though simple, suggests a space for preliminary rituals. Moving to the second level, another shaft descends 20 meters, leading to a more intricate chamber, possibly used for burials or symbolizing the journey to the afterlife. The deepest level, 30 meters below the surface, houses a stone sarcophagus partially submerged in water, evoking themes of rebirth and the underworld. This level also reveals six empty burial shafts, sparking questions about their purpose. Despite the lack of inscriptions, pottery shards and stone fragments suggest the Osiris shaft dates to the New Kingdom period. Each artifact offers clues, helping unravel this ancient structure's mystery. The mummified remains are among the most touching discoveries in the smaller chambers surrounding the central sarcophagus. While grand monuments and temples offer historical context, these remains directly connect to the people of ancient Egypt. Studying them gives insight into their daily lives, diets, and possibly even their deaths. The Osiris Shaft is named after Osiris, the Egyptian god of the afterlife, death, and rebirth. His story of betrayal, death, and resurrection by his wife, Isis, is central to Egyptian mythology. The Osiris Shaft, with its chamber submerged in water, symbolizes the underworld and Osiris's journey through death. Some believe the Osiris Shaft was used for initiation rituals, where participants underwent symbolic trials, reflecting Osiris's experiences. The design may have been aligned with celestial bodies, representing the soul's journey beyond death. The layout and artifacts within the shaft echo ancient Egyptian texts, like the Pyramid Texts and the Book of the Dead, making it a physical link to their beliefs and customs. One entrance to the Osiris Shaft is located to the south, while another is to the north. Photos from a 2011 expedition show how the northern entrance has changed. In older images, the central opening was a weathered hole in the bedrock about six feet tall, with no visible chisel marks. Next to it, on the left, was a secondary eroded tunnel. At that time, the main entrance provided easy access to the underground tunnel system. Today, however, much of this opening has been sealed off with a concrete wall and the depression below it has been filled with sand, likely to obscure the entrance from public view. The secondary tunnel has also been filled in and covered with sand. Visitors who remember the site from earlier times are often surprised by these significant changes, as what was once an obvious entry point is now largely hidden. 
These alterations suggest that the Osiris shaft was not initially intended for regular access. There were no ladders or other easy ways to descend. The ladders seen today were added later by archaeologists. Additionally, it raises the question of why the builders brought massive granite boxes underground instead of simply carving burial chambers into the bedrock. Using just lids would have been a more straightforward method. The sarcophagi within the Osiris shaft are made from a different type of stone than the shaft itself, and lack inscriptions, leaving their true purpose a mystery. The shaft was carved directly from solid bedrock, with no stonework to help date its construction, making it difficult to determine its age using conventional methods. Stone dating techniques on the sarcophagi indicate their extreme antiquity, with one made from an unusual type of stone. Each coffin is estimated to weigh around 40 tons, a substantial weight that would have required careful handling. Lowering these massive objects into the shaft using ropes while keeping them stable seems almost unimaginable. Perhaps the water in the shaft played a role in this delicate operation, as any error could have permanently blocked the entrance due to the coffin's immense weight. Despite these risks, the builders appeared confident in managing the task. On the south wall of level 2 is a massive black stone sarcophagus with a surface coated in a thin layer of bitumen. Upon closer inspection, a wide area beneath the bitumen is illuminated white, typically associated with metals. This metallic coating, primarily lead with zinc, iron, titanium, and arsenic traces, suggests that the stone surface might have been treated or painted. However, the purpose of this metallic layer remains to be determined. A prominent feature of the Osiris shaft is a massive gray coffin on the north wall, made of the rare mineral Dacite. This mineral is unique in ancient Egyptian history, as no Dacite deposits in Africa could produce such a large sarcophagus. This suggests it was imported from outside Africa, possibly Europe or the Black Sea. Dacite, a rock composed of feldspar and quartz, is found far from Giza, making transporting it to the site a logistical challenge. Why the Egyptians chose this difficult option instead of using local granite or basalt remains a mystery. Further research dated the sarcophagus to pre-dynastic times, around 3350 BC, much earlier than the Giza pyramids. The dating was done using a new optical thermoluminescence technique developed by Professor Yanis Leitus. This method measures the last exposure to light of stone crystals, allowing accurate dating of ancient artifacts. By analyzing the number of electrons in the crystal, scientists can determine how long it has been since it was last exposed to sunlight, providing precise dating of the coffin. What do you think about the Decite sarcophagus mystery? Graham Hancock has produced books containing somewhat eccentric theories, such as fingerprints and magicians of the gods. He goes against conventional archaeology to advance the theory of an ancient civilization that, in terms of architecture and mathematics, had progressed much beyond the early ape-like beings of the Paleolithic Age. Hancock is convinced that this may be one of the relics of this ancient civilization, as the layout of the Osiris shaft tells a lot about the kind of technology they possessed and their way of life. According to him, this orientation presents relations to celestial events or, more precisely, constellations connected to Osiris as a symbol of life, death, and rebirth among the Egyptians. Hancock's theories may involve a host of global catastrophes or cataclysms, mainly the comet impacts approximately between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, during the Younger Dryas event. These postulates could have been the cause of the demise of the thought to have been an advanced civilization. Officially, the Sphinx is supposed to be about 2,500 BC, in other words, 4,500 years ago. Yeah. Um, but the evidence of that it was exposed to about a thousand years of heavy rainfall means that it must be much older than that because there was no such rainfall in Egypt four and a half thousand years yeah. ago. And you have to go back to the Younger Dryas to find that humid, wet period. Hancock has some arguments and considerations about the nature of the water at the lower levels of the Osiris shaft that a flood would have filled on different occasions. But as for hypothesizing that the water is not only groundwater seepage, but also, and above all, proves that in various occasions, different and catastrophic floods hit that lost civilization. He also believes the hypothesis of the American academician Robert M. Schock according to whom the Great Sphinx is considerably older than it is generally presupposed, namely 4,500 years old. Shock, 
a geologist, realized that water erosion was the cause of the erosion around the Sphinx, which indicated that the structure was made during a wet period that most estimate to be between 8,000 and 10,000 BC. Hancock buys into this theory because it supports his theory of an advanced society that once existed in the world, but previous histories did not capture it. The theory that heavy rainfall caused the Sphinx erosion is intriguing and controversial. Traditional archaeologists date the Sphinx to Pharaoh Khafre's reign based on its location and stylistic similarities. However, geologist Robert Schock suggests the Sphinx could be much older, possibly from the Neolithic era. He argues that the erosion patterns on the Sphinx are more consistent with water erosion, pointing to deep cracks, smooth contours, and varying limestone hardness as evidence. Schock's research indicates that the region was wetter between 10,000 and 5,000 BCE, potentially causing the observed erosion. If correct, this theory suggests the Sphinx predates Khafre by thousands of years, challenging our understanding of ancient Egyptian history. The tunnels at the Osiris shaft might connect to a broader network beneath the Giza Plateau. On the third level, an unexcavated section suggests these tunnels could be part of an interconnected system. Historically, many ancient tunnels lacked ceilings, and there's a rumor of a travel route from Saqqara to Giza, though it needs to be confirmed. Extensive underground tunnels exist, such as those at Tuna El Gebel, 3 kilometers, and beneath the Steppe Pyramid, 56 kilometers if straightened. These structures are connected to the pyramids. In the first tunnel, wind erosion and water at the bottom indicate it's at the Nile's water table. As of 2012, pumping out the water has been characterized as continued, implying that the tunnels may have been a part of the old flow of the Nile. Their tendency to flood means that, in all likelihood, the tunnels were constructed as drainage systems rather than roadways. Hancock theorizes that an advanced civilization predating well-known societies like the Egyptians and Sumerians existed globally but vanished suddenly, leaving only remnants. He suggests survivors spread their advanced knowledge worldwide, influencing other ancient cultures. Hancock interprets myths and flood stories worldwide as a record of an event originating from comet impacts, which affected the Gulf Stream and adversely impacted climate change. Hancock is interested in such structures as the pyramids, Stonehenge, and some monumental structures in South America, which he argues kept secret knowledge and technology. He proceeds to give examples of Puma Punkyu, where stones have been cut accurately, and the use of the golden ratio in geometry and pyramids such as the Great Pyramid of Giza. Hancock also examines the alignment of the Giza pyramids with Orion's belt and the Sphinx's alignment with Leo, suggesting that these were intentional and reflect a deep astronomical understanding. What do you think about Hancock's theory? Share your thoughts below and remember to subscribe to the channel for more exciting content.